And welcome to our annual Alumni Leaders on Campus Day. We're excited to bring this panel discussion to you virtually this year. This program is a collaboration between the Office of Alumni Relations and the College of Arts and Sciences and celebrates our alumni who are doing such great things in their respective facets of the industry. We have some amazing alumni here to speak with you today and we're so grateful that you have taken time out of their that they have taken time out of their very busy schedules to be here. I know that you'll find their experiences and stories inspiring. And if you have questions for the alumni, please enter it in the Q&A section and we'll get to it as many as we can towards the end of the program. Right now, I'm going to ask the alumni to please take a moment to introduce themselves and share your major, the year you graduated, your current position and a brief description of what you do. So I am gonna um, call them out first, um, just in case uh, anyone wants to know, I am Rory Sinertia and I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. So welcome everyone for coming today. So I'm gonna start with Sarah Lovett. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lovett. I graduated from Johnson and Wales in 2017 with a degree in equine business management and riding. I am also um, a alumni in a master's program of sports leadership, which I completed in May of 2020. I currently am the equine manager at Wild Star Farm in Sherburn, Massachusetts, as well as um, the riding instructor and program assistant of um, Horse Sensibility, which is run out of uh, Wild Star Farm. I am a CHA certified instructor, which is Certified Horsemanship Association, as well as a Massachusetts licensed um, riding instructor. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to turn now to Gregory Miller. Hey, my name Hey, my name is Greg. Um, I graduated Johnson & Wales in 2017 um, with a degree in media communications. Um, I currently work at a company called BuildUp. It's a commercial real estate platform, a startup company in downtown Boston. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next, I'm going to turn to Tiffany Resendez. I am Tiffany Resendez. I graduated Johnson & Wales 2018 with my degree in counseling psychology. I currently work as a family preservation worker for a children's friend in Providence. Um, we work very closely with the Department of Children, Youth and Families to help families that are affected by substance use. Thank you, Tiffany. And finally, I'm gonna turn to Niall. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Niall Vele. I graduated in 2017 in Media Communication Studies. I currently work for the Quarto Publishing Group here in Massachusetts. I work with children's books, craft books, gardening, cooking, you name it. It's really fun, I love it. I'm an editorial project manager and I've been in this field for about three years now. Great, thank you. Now I'm gonna ask you to keep your camera on and I, I'm gonna ask the rest of uh, the alumni to turn their cameras back on. And I'm gonna be asking questions to the group first. Um, I have a few questions here. And then after those questions, we will turn to the students who are with us today. Um, so the first question I'm gonna ask to the group is, can you tell us about your first jobs after graduation and how those led to other opportunities? Maybe if Greg wants to start. Um, when I graduated Johnson & Wales, um, I got a part-time job working as a photo and video editor for a company called Coffee Pond out of um, Natick, Mass. And um, what we would do is take um, senior portraits from high schools and then um, videos and footage from like their football games and their graduations and then edit it down um, and then, you know, remove like blemishes and things like that. Um, after that, I um, worked for Hasbro for a little bit as a content creator before um, getting a job that I had for about three years with a company called CTM Media Group in Greater Boston. And that was the first, like, you know, on my own really major company that I worked for, and I moved up to Boston for it. Um, I was a content creator there for uh, almost three years before um, moving to the company I currently work at called BuildUp. And um, right there, I'm an editor and a digital content creator. Thanks. 
Sorry, I'm muted. Niall, do you want to go next? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I actually started off at the Cordo Publishing Group. Um, before I graduated, I was their intern. And then I ended up getting hired as their editorial assistant in their Minneapolis office. Uh, so I worked there for about a year and a half as an editorial assistant. I worked with authors, I worked with designers, and I worked with um, the other editorial project managers who trained me to become an editorial project manager. Um, it was pretty awesome. I was also able to hire some of our internships um, there, which was pretty cool. We worked with a lot of the local colleges and that also molded me to be the editorial project manager that I am today. I also work with hiring some of the, um, the internships that we have. We're molding a new internship program right now as well. Um, when I was the editorial project manager um, here, which I am now, um, I still use some of the skills that I started out with as an editorial assistant. And to this day, like I'm very thankful for the path that I chose. Um, I even got to use some of my skills with video productions because sometimes we do um, sales promotions and we have to do videos to promote those books. Um, they're not usually seen in the public, but it's how we promote our books to booksellers, to other outlets, and it's pretty cool. Fascinating, and so it's really great to see that you know, the internships definitely help, um, have helped you in your career. So thank you. Uh, Sarah. So before my current position, um, I worked at Mass Hospital School, which is also known as um, Pappas Rehabilitation Hospital for Children. Um, in that role, I was a barn assistant there part-time throughout college. Um, once I graduated from Johnson Wales and I had an instructor's license, I was able to um, teach therapeutic horseback riding lessons at the facility, as well as help out in the recreation um, department, run summer camps, stuff like that. And that job actually led um, me to be in touch with one of um, my coworkers there that um, helped me get this position that I'm at now at Wild Star Farm. Wonderful. And I, and I believe therapeutic riding really is such a a growing industry in a very important field. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And Tiffany. Um, so after graduation, I started my first job um, in case management, because um, that's primarily what you do at bachelor level in psychology. Um, so I did that job. Um, it was working with children's and children and families, which is very similar to what I do now. Um, the difference uh, between that, the work that I did then and the work that I do now is that my work now is more focused on substance affected families. Um, whereas prior to that, my role, um, so in working with substance affected families, I work primarily with parents more than I do with the children, even though the children are my clients. Um, whereas in my previous role, the children were my clients and I was actually like, doing a lot of like playtime with them and talking to them and then only checking in with parents here and there. Um, so it definitely prepared me for this role that I'm in now because I got to kind of understand more of the family structure and interacting with families, um, as well as interacting with the, the department and other providers in the community, becoming more familiar with those providers, um, which I was able to carry over into my role now um, in connecting families to those. Wonderful, thank you so much. And unfortunately with the pandemic, you know, your, your position is even more um, important than it has been um, in the past. So the next question I have, and this is so important, especially for the students who are listening today, is how did the university help prepare you for a successful career? Um, so we'll start with Niall. Um, yeah, so I would definitely say like choosing Johnson & Wells one was the best decision I could have ever made. Um, I wasn't sure at first exactly which path I wanted to go in. I was like, do I want to do video productions? Do I want to do writing? Do I want to do editing? I just knew I wanted to do media. Um, to this day, I still feel like the world is my oyster. I can do whatever. And that's because of the professors that I had. I still feel like I have those skills to this day that I can go a different path if I wanted to. Um, I chose editing simply because, um, Shout out to Professor Garcia um, because she really, really gave me the inspiration to work in publishing. I really wanted to be a writer. I wanted 
I knew I wanted to be a writer. I want to be an, an author one day, but I wanted to know the ins and outs of publishing so that I'm prepared for that road to come in the future. So because those professors are so nice, so um, knowledgeable and they're helpful, their resources are unlimited and I appreciate everything that I've gotten from them. Um, I feel like I'm still in contact with them. I know that they can always help me if I needed it. I'm still in contact with Professor Westgate, Professor Oberacker, they're amazing and their resources, fantastic. I cannot recommend keeping in contact with them enough. Um, so with that being said, I, again, I'm very appreciative of everything that Johnson & Wales gave me and I continuously talk about them at my job. And we actually have a Johnson & Wales student working for us right now as an intern. So shout outs to you guys. Oh, that, that warms my heart. I mean, obviously I'm a little biased because I work with these faculty every day and I know how amazing they are, but it's just so great to hear from students and alumni saying, you know, reiterating what I see every single day. So I do thank you for that. And I think it's important. Um, I loved how you said the world is your oyster, um, especially coming from the College of Arts and Sciences, because many of our programs are so interdisciplinary that when you do go to an employer, you have such strengths in multiple backgrounds within the College of Arts and Sciences. So I think that's great. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, I'm gonna turn it to Tiffany now, same question. Um, so I actually ended up at Johnson & Wales because one of the professors, um, Dr. Jessica Feedy, um, so she was kind of like a mentor to me at the Community College of Rhode Island. And I did some like uh, work for her there um, with her psychology students. And then when she transitioned to Johnson & Wales, she was telling me about it. Um, and I started to look into the program and I realized it was actually a really good fit for me. Um, and so when I started to attend, she continued kind of in that mentor role with me throughout Johnson & Wales. And even to this day, um, she's been my mentor for like nine years now. Um, super helpful. So I definitely agree with what Niall said about the professors. Um, and then the counseling psychology program itself, definitely in my everyday work, I'm always referring back to things that I learned in the program, um, especially obviously now in my role with substance affected families, I'm always referring back to my addictions class um, and kind of the things that I learned about counseling families and addictions and things like that. So um, I really love the program. I think that it's definitely helpful transferring from the school work to real life. Um, and the internship opportunity was super helpful too. Um, I was able to intern at the domestic violence um, shelter for women um, during I think my junior year um, and that helped me actually get a lot of hands-on experience that I was able to you know put on my resume and then use in my initial role too out of college so that was really awesome. Thank you Tiffany so yes thank you for once again reiterating what many of you have already said how important internships are and obviously the connection and staying connected to faculty so thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Sarah now same question. So the professors are definitely different at Johnson & Wales than any other university, um, which is why I decided to do my master's program there as well. Um, they take the time to really focus on you as individuals. You're not just like a number in a class of 500. Um, everyone's a person. Um, the professors are very personable. And I think that for especially the equine program, the best thing about it is the labs. We have a barn in Rehoboth. Um, you'd go out there every single week, multiple times a week to do your labs, um, ride multiple times a week. So you were getting hands-on experience while you were um, at the facility. And also I had the opportunity to be a student assistant at the barn. So I got to work alongside um, the bar managers and also um, I got to um, help the new students coming in um, learn their role as uh, students at the university. Wonderful, thank you so much. That, that again warms my heart to know that everything that we have done at Johnson Wales, um, especially in the College of Arts and Sciences in terms of creating these hands-on experiences before students even go out into um, the industry um, with internships and whatnot. And again, I know how special our faculty are. So I thank you again, Sarah, for that. I'm gonna turn to Greg now. Yeah, definitely. I think um, the thing that makes Johnson & Wales different from anywhere else that I've been um, or anywhere else that I know of is the intimacy of the faculty to students um, at the College of Art and Sciences. It's really different here than it is 
um, at other universities. Um, the one-on-one -on -one that you're able to get with um, your professors is just, um, like, it's invaluable. You use that, you know, what you learn and what um, you think about here in this environment out in the real world. Um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, speaking with um, like, you know, Dr. Roberak or, um, or um, Dr. Church, you know, it's, they, they really are there to help you grow and to make you think about what you want to do beyond college. And um, not just grow in your own field, but grow as a person. Um, and the class that Niall and I were in um, was just a really small group. And it's, um, it was, I think, the first graduating class for media communication. So we were the test subjects. And it was just um, such a cool experience that we were helping like shape the curriculum as it went along. And everyone was just so receptive of, well, did this work? And if it didn't, they were honest about it. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's not something that you can find anywhere else. And, you know, my time at Johnson & Wales was where I kind of learned what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And it's, it, it was almost like a big incubation tank that you could just grow into what you wanted to be. And then once you graduated and moved on, you kind of had an understanding as to how you should approach the world. And, you know, that not everything's going to be handed to you. And that's fine because you learned that there are ways that you can handle it and you can always grow. And then retaining um, your relationships with your professors after you graduate is just, you know, absolutely crucial um, to help, you know, shape you as a person and put you in the career that you want. Um, maybe discover a new career path that you didn't even think about, you know, these, these people are here to help you like for your entire life. <laughs> Jack, thank you so much. You know, I couldn't agree more. Um, so I actually want to introduce Lindsay Etter. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Lindsay. Um, she just joined us. So Lindsay, if you wouldn't mind just um, introducing yourself, um, telling us uh, the year you graduated, your major, the current position, and a brief description of what you do. Uh, my name's Lindsay Etter. Um, I will say there's kittens in here, so if they come across the screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I graduated in 2014 for equine business management. Um, I currently own my own facility. Um, I have about 32, 33 horses. Um, I do training, boarding, lessons. Um, I actually have two Johnson Whale students that work for me. Um, so I have a pretty, pretty big group here, <laughs> horses and people, so. Wonderful. Um, you know, you didn't miss much in terms of the questions that we've been sharing and asking. Um, if you wouldn't mind just explaining a little bit about um, how the university helped you prepare you for what you do now, your successful career. Um, I would say they gave me a really good um, beginning ground to kind of stand on as far as learning a lot of certain things that I didn't know in the beginning uh, freshman year learning how to interact with certain people uh, in the professional world. Um, and those of you that don't really understand the horse world, a lot of people don't, it's a very tough place to be sometimes, um, trying to mingle with both horses and people. Um, but they really kind of gave me a good ground to stand on and how to deal with a lot of situations in the professional world. And I would say they gave me a lot of opportunities to kind of spread my horizon of learning anything about horses and just taking it from there. They gave me a lot of opportunities, uh, junior and senior year to get a job, um, trying to do some opportunities in the horse world. And they just kind of, they were really very, very, very helpful to get me started. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a couple more questions before we move on to students asking their questions. So I'm actually just gonna go in the order that I see your faces on my screen. It may not be the same as everyone else. So again, I'll just um, introduce your name. So I'm gonna choose Niall first, you're first on my screen. And this is, will be the same question to everyone. Something we all discuss as we get older is the old, if I knew then what I know now. The audience and I would like to hear what you would have done differently during your undergraduate years and how it might've helped you. Uh, this might be working part-time, taking different or extra courses, joining certain clubs, just anything that you would, if you could go back and do anything a bit, a little bit differently, what would it be? Mm. 
Um, there are definitely some courses that I wish I would have taken when I was an undergrad. Um, one of them, I believe was writing for um, television. Um, the reason why I wanted to take that course is because I would have loved to learn how to do script writing. Um, a lot of my student, a lot of the students that were in my major, they did that class and they always were telling me like, oh, I have this script and it's so good. And I was like, dang, I wish I would have known how to like do that. Um, but my friend Autumn um, Hawkins, who's also in our major, Greg knows her as well. She also like mentors me sometimes about that. So we piggyback off the off of ideas of that. Um, I also wish that I would have, I guess, applied more um, of the video production class that I had. I know it was like at the end of our our term there. I wish like maybe it would have been a little bit sooner so that I could have like done more with it. Um, I still love the projects that I did in that class. Still, I work on them to this day. Sometimes I like to go back and edit them every now and again. Um, so that's another thing. I also wish I would have done maybe a little bit more clubs, a little bit more networking within um, the university, just because like there are definitely a lot of people at our school that are possibly doing some media related projects, media related jobs that I would have loved to network with and connect with for sure. Thank you. I think that's so important. I'm actually going to skip out of line just for a second and welcome Kaylin. Um, we're so excited to have you. Um, we're so happy that you made it. So you can just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. Um, your, what was your major when you were at Johnson & Wales? Um, what are you doing now? And then if you can just briefly touch upon what you feel Johnson & Wales was able to do, in particular the College of Arts and Sciences, to get you where you are today. Okay, thanks so much. It's nice to see everybody. Um, nice to meet you all virtually. So I am Kaylin Pelletier Koenig. I am a staff attorney at Operation Stand Down Rhode Island. Um, and before I get into what that is, I'll just go over, I think, what you asked me. Um, so I graduated in 2014 with my bachelor's in criminal justice. Um, so I spent 2011 to 2014 at JWU. I did the early enrollment program and then the SHARP program, um, which was not great. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. So I'm a staff attorney. So what I do um, is I work at a nonprofit and we provide what we call wraparound services to active duty military members and veterans. So we work with every anybody who has served at some point in their life, whether it was National Guard, active duty, reserves, whatever it is. Um, and we really provide four main things to them. So one is housing assistance. So we get grants from the federal, the federal government and the state to help people who are um, at risk of homelessness or who are homeless to get them on their feet. So we can do things like pay rental arrears if someone's facing eviction, first, last, first and last month's rent or first in security if they need to get into a new place. Um, and then actually uh, moving expenses and rent going forward if the situation warrants. And then we also have an employment and training team. And what they do is they actually work with community providers and employers in the state, and they actually place military members and veterans in those jobs. Um, so it's kind of like career services, only they go a step further and actually facilitate that conversation and get them enrolled in that job. And then on the other hand, they can actually assist with training. So they will place veterans in training programs and they will help pay some expenses while they're doing that, really help them get the certifications they need to succeed. We have a food pantry as well as a clothing shed. So we provide whatever they need there. And then we, our newest program is actually our legal services program, which is where I come in. Um, so I provide a whole host of civil legal services to veterans, some of which are completely free, some of which are on a reduced fee basis, um, which is why I was late today. I had court this morning. Um, so I, my main focus, about 40% of my caseload is social security disability. Um, so I help veterans and military members as well as their dependents, so people who financially depend on them, um, get SSI, SSDI, whatever it is. Um, and that includes both just filing the initial paperwork if they really just need help with that, up to and including representing them at a social security hearing, which is what I was just doing. And then the other parts of my practice, I do eviction defense. So any eviction that walks into our office is automatically referred to me and I will provide them um, a legal defense in that eviction, even if it's something as simple as buying them times to try and ward off homelessness. I do limited family law cases, um, which I'm trying to wind down on, but for some reason they just don't seem to let me go on that one. I do criminal record expungement, driver's license recovery, 
And then I also assist with um, obtaining and appealing negative food stamp applications. Um, and then, so for Johnson & Wales, I already forget part of the question. I think it was what they what ha what I did at Johnson & Wales that helped me get where I am today. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, sorry, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> um, so one thing that really helped me, um, and that I still am in regular contact with some of my professors, is I was actually part of the collaborative learning program. So um, I'm not sure who knows what that is or, or what it is, or if they participated themselves. But essentially what it did is in my first year as a student, my criminal justice professor and my English professor actually worked in conjunction. Um, so it was basically a shared experience. So uh, they brought a lot of principles of writing into the criminal justice class. And then in the English class, they tried to incorporate the law and the criminal justice aspects. And for me, that was huge. Um, and simply because I didn't know I'd be going on to law school, that was its own weird decision as that happened. Um, but it really ended up helping me because we practiced legal writing as an undergrad student, which is really kind of unheard for if you're in, unless you're in a pre-law program. So when I got to law school and a lot of my peers are struggling to learn to write things like memos and affidavits and use that legal jargon and that that really that they, they call it its own language. It, it really is. You have to learn it. I was sitting there saying, oh, no, I did that in, in college. I, I've already done that. I've already had three affidavits created because that's what my professors did. Um, and that really, really helped me to the point that I actually made something called law review, which I'm not going to get into what it is. It's this really pretentious, onerous thing. You can Google what law review is and why everybody wants it. It really gives you a, a, a leg up when getting jobs outside of law school. Um, but out of about 140 kids in my class, um, I was one of about 18 that made law reviews. So that actually really went a long way having that experience um, with legal writing from an early age. I was kind of a step ahead, um, which was really great for me. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, I'm learning so much. And again, like I've said before, I know how amazing our students are every day, but just to see this validation for myself. So I do thank you and, and the faculty that are watching today. So that's wonderful. And I think it's also wonderful to see that all of you are part of some field that really is helping the community, um, connecting individuals, supporting individuals. So I thank you all for that. All right, so if I remember, I think I went from Niall, then I went to Kaylin. So I'm gonna go back to Greg. Um, if I am correct, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but Greg, let me just kind of remind you of the question on, you know, if you knew what I know now kind of thing. If, if you could go back to Johnson Wales, is there anything that you would have done differently? I don't know if I even would have done anything different than what I did. Um, I just wish I had more time because I had transferred into um, Johnson Wales from Community College of Rhode Island. So I was only there for two years. Um, I really wish that I was um, able to start from like freshman year all the way to senior. And then I wish I did my master's too, um, the four in one program. That's something that if anyone here is um, interested in, if this is even still offered, that you should like absolutely take advantage of because um, getting your master's program at this college is something that like, you know, we should be thinking about. Um, I, I really like came into Johnson and Wales not knowing what I wanted to do or having an idea of what I wanted to do, but like not being in a you know position in life that I was like too happy. And then it just completely changed there. Um, I think my first or second term at Johnson and Wales, um, using uh, media production classes that I had taken, um, I produced um, a hip hop TV show that I put on public access just because I wanted to do it. And it spent about eight months of my time, but um, you know, that was something I could then say, like I put you know, something on TV. And um, then my senior year, um, I got involved in real estate in down in Providence, um, just you know, in um, part-time outside of class, outside of work. Um, where I got to know and I got to network with um, real estate developers and property managers and um, urban planners and city officials all downtown just because of where we were. And, and if I ever had a question for how I should be approaching something or um, how I should talk to someone, you know, try to get an into what I wanted to do, um, all of my professors were always having after hour studies that I could go up to their rooms and then just talk to them. Um, so I don't think I would have done anything different except just, you know, absorb as much as I could while I was there and, you know, um, maybe take even, you know, more classes if I could have, um, shot more, you know, uh, school projects with, uh, my classmates, you know, that I could have done. So, you know, as much as I can absorb. That's wonderful. So I'm starting to see a theme here of networking, how important that is. 
Um, so thank you for that. Sarah, would you mind telling us what you would have done differently? Um, I have to echo that the master's programs um, is very important. And I did my master's, um, got done with that in 2020. I would have loved to do the four plus one, but at the time I was just kind of focusing on um, getting through my undergrad, which all of you are probably just trying to get through your undergrad. Maybe you have a part-time job. So you have a lot going on to begin with, um, which I definitely felt was the case. Um, and I wish I would have networked a lot more um, during my undergrad. It's very interesting at Johnson & Wales. Um, once you leave Johnson & Wales and you say to someone, oh, I went to college at Johnson & Wales and the other person you're talking to did as well, you have an instant connection with them, which is very strange, but you kind of get it. Um, and I've worked a lot of different jobs in the equine field, but I have to say when I find my Johnson & Wales alums, um, we kind of just get each other unlike other colleges. I don't know why, um, but I work a lot with um, some Johnson & Wales alumni. I have um, one that's currently on the board here at for sensibility. Um, and I have a few that volunteer for me here as well. So it's just that connection that you kind of want um, with your college and alumni, which will definitely help prepare you in different aspects of your career. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna move to Tiffany now. Um, so definitely echoing what Sarah said about, you know, when you're an undergrad, you're just kind of trying to get through it. Um, so what I would do differently is definitely have taken more time to really soak and reflect on what I was being taught at the moment. Um, because now that I'm in my career, I'm like, wow, that class was super helpful. I just don't remember a lot of it. So it's like the little pieces that I do remember have come in handy so much that I wish I would have really soaked in the rest of it instead of kind of just doing the work to get through it and trying to like cram all this stuff um, in my mind instead of really taking that time to like take it in. So yeah, it is so hard, right, when you're in the moment, and like Sarah said, you might have a job, or, you know, certainly I teach uh, seniors, and they just can't wait to get out of here, and I always tell them, take your time, take your time, you're going to work for the rest of your life, so. All right, Lindsay, what can you tell us? Um, I guess, honestly, out of everything, um, I would probably go back to wanting to either major in accounting <laughs> on top of my major. Um, because I will say the taxes involved with my business are very hard to do. Um, and I would just, you know, like uh, Tiffany had said about paying attention a little bit more and like you forget what you kind of learn in those classes. I took an accounting class and I was going to um, double major in it, but I just felt like I didn't have time. Um, I was working two jobs, you know, riding and stuff like that. But I do kind of wish I had learned a little bit more about the accounting because now in my field, I have my own accountant <laughs> that kind of helps me with my business, um, which I mean, luckily enough is my sister. Um, so she kind of helps me. So it's kind of nice, but I still have to pay her. So um, yeah, I would just say that would be the only thing I would do differently, um, if anything. Wonderful. Thank you. Kaylin, do you want to add to this conversation, please? Sure. I don't know what I missed, um, but my biggest thing looking back um, is definitely experiential learning. Um, it, it was a thing back then, back in, I think it was 2011, 2012, but nothing compared to what it is now. Um, and I just, I feel like that's one of the most valuable things you can take out of um, college. So specifically in the criminal justice and the legal fields, um, not to say that your GPA isn't important, obviously it is, but more and more, I'm finding that your the experience that you can bring, that free labor that you kind of did, it really does pay off, um, especially with the economy the way it is. Employers are looking to spend less and less money, and that means spending less money training you if they can help it. So I come from a blue-collar family. I'm a first-generation college kid. I didn't have any contacts or connections in the legal or criminal justice world. I was brand new. I knew nobody. Um, and because of that, and I didn't really get much experiential learning when I was there, I, I kind of had a harder time 
either knowing how to find jobs or finding jobs, or I, I didn't have that person to go to for advice. Um, and I would have really appreciated having that um, coming out of it. And then even in law school. So I, I kind of took that different approach in law school and I really focused more, I think 14 of my credits were experiential learning. Um, and it really paid off. It's how I ended up in the job I have today. Um, I ended up interning and then I got a fellowship with that program and then they connected me with the program I am today. It kind of all was down one path. So it kind of going back to networking, the, the bigger your network is, the more context you have, the more people you can go to for help, you, the more experience you can bring to the table. Um, I think that's really one of the most beneficial things you can get in college. Um, I Personally, I think that's just as important as your GPA and I could be biased, but I really do. When I look at a, a resume, I'm probably looking at the GPA for a second. What I'm really looking at is the experience they can bring. Wow, thank you so much. I think yeah, I agree with you, and I, and I see a lot of head shaking here how important the experiential learning is. And that's certainly a piece that Jonathan Wales has been improving upon and um, trying to perfect as much as possible, even prior to you all going out um, and getting an internship. So, my next question again, I'm going to return back to um, Niall um, is what qualities do you look for in your younger team members? You know, you've mentioned that you have a few Jonathan Wales students who are working within your company, but when you're looking to hire someone or even to hire someone for an internship, what qualities do you look for? So it's funny you say that I'm actually the youngest person at my job. <laughs> so um, to look at someone younger than me um, coming in, definitely they need to have the passion, they need to have the drive and the motivation. Um, again, to piggyback off of um, the, uh, of Kaylin, I also want to look at the experience that you have. It doesn't necessarily mean you needed to have work in this field, but I need to know that you at least have the skills to work in this field. Um, so that means like, did you take a technical editing class? Did you do any type of editing, writing? Um, do you have any experience with children's books, children's novels, art, craft, anything of that nature. Um, I'm also looking for someone with a mature level as well, because um, a lot of our internships in the past, um, they have not been <laughs> as mature as we would like them to be. Um, so we definitely look into that as well. So just walk into a job with your head up like, you don't need to, you know, let them know, yeah, I'm 23, 22, and I'm young, I've never worked in this field. Don't walk in the door like that. Walk in the door as if you've worked in this job for 10 years, because you want the respect from your colleagues. You don't want them to look at you as a child or, oh, you're like my, my daughter or my niece, my nephew. You don't want them to think that. You want them to say, this person is at my level, and I can respect them. So that's the biggest thing that you want and that I look for because I respect my interns when they are just on my level as well. Like they talk to me with respect and I give them the same thing as well. Thank you so much, Don. You, you make me think of a TED talk. I don't know if any of you have ever had to watch it. I know I used to show it in my classes, um, fake it till you make it. Um, and in, in it, it's all about going in with that confidence, even though inside you might be shaking, but when you're talking to someone, I know exactly what I'm doing and be proud of where you're coming from. So thank you. Greg, what, what can you share with us about individuals that you are looking to hire as an internship or to work with them? I wanna echo with um, what Niall said because it's uh, very accurate. Um, one of the things that I did when I first got out of high school and I was um, in CCRI was um, I applied for jobs that I knew I wouldn't get. I like, you know, jobs that you needed like, you know, 10 plus years of experience. Um, just to see if I could get um, an interview because the thing that I was most afraid of was a job interview sitting down and talking a person to person and having to justify yourself was horrifying to me so that's what I just did over and over and over again and there were a couple times that um, I was given an offer for um, a field that you know I wasn't actually <laughs> going to work in nor was I qualified for um, so I definitely think if um, you want a particular um, to work in a particular field, don't think about the job itself. Um, think about what you can offer. So, um, you know, that can be anything from a portfolio of work to um, maybe an example, you know, if it's um, in a technical field, see if you can build something, see if you can, you know, offer like evidence that um, you worked on something. If it's in media production, do you have examples of um, programs that you worked on? Do you have writing samples? Um, and it doesn't need to be like 
formatted in a certain way. It really doesn't. You, everyone thinks, oh, I have to have a portfolio, you know, so you're, they're thinking about what color the binder is or what the lamin is. It, it's, it's more about the content. And if you're interested in something, um, just be passionate about it and really work towards it and um, bring that to whatever you're applying for and be ready to apply. Because even when the economy was booming, when I graduated, I applied to hundreds and hundreds of jobs um, because I wanted to find one that, you know, was a right fit for me. Um, so just be prepared to work, but understand that everyone has to. And it's something that, um, you know, every single person um, in this um, in this webinar and, you know, sitting next to you um, had to go through at some point in their life and it's okay. And just don't get frustrated and just keep working at it. Wow. That's such great advice. Thank you so much. Sarah, what can you say? So I look for um, younger team members who are efficient and timely along with um, being a team player. I myself am probably one of the youngest here at Wildstar Farm. Um, we have a few coworkers that are younger than me, but I'm one of the primary full-time staff. So you have to not be afraid to do jobs that are lower than you, but also go above and beyond. So there's no um, point. You can't just say, okay, well, this is my job. This is all I'm going to do. You have to really expand and be diverse. Um, this morning I was feeding horses and mucking out stalls before I jumped on this webinar, but I also um, later today I'm going to run a virtual um, horse um, club and also work on fundraising. So you can't just limit yourself. And I think that that's a very key point. Um, when I interviewed here at Wild Star Farm, they were a little hesitant because I was on the younger side, but you have to go into some place with confidence for job interviews. And you also have to prove yourself in multiple different ways. Yeah, I think that's really important for our students to hear that, you know, from, as Kaylin had said, you know, that experiential education and Niall said, listing the specific courses that are important. Um, but you, you do have to prove yourself. It's more than just that degree, right? The, the degree absolutely helps, but then when you get there, you have to show that you are, you are capable. So thank you for that. Lindsay, what qualities do you look for in a team member? Um, so the number one thing that I would definitely say I look for is um, being able to survive in this job. <laughs> um, you kind of have to have like some grit when it comes to some horses and people and dealing with different clientele um, and different horses really. Um, and kind of like Sarah said, like even though you have the degree, you have to be able to take it a little bit further. Um, passion is definitely a number one thing. You have to be into this. You know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't have the passion. Um, and I enjoy what I'm doing every single day. There's harder days than others. And, you, you know, you're faced with a lot of things that you really didn't think what you were going to. Um, but you learn to adapt to a lot of change. So someone that comes in when I interview them, I really do like to see if they have integrity, you know, to do the right thing. They really need to, especially around a business with horses where, it's someone else's animal and you need to be able to act in a very appropriate way to take care of things and, you know, be nice to all the people work very well together. So it's, it's a lot to kind of, you know, put together when someone comes in, but you can typically see who has it and who doesn't. I'm always willing to give people chances that work for me. Um, I have six people that work for me right now. So, and it's a big age range. I have younger and older and I'm like right in the middle. So um, I'm 29 and I get a lot of clientele that are a lot older than me. So you have to really prove yourself that you're capable of doing this job and people have to trust you, so. Yeah, really um, important qualities, as you said, you know, that passion, I keep hearing that more and more. So thank you for sharing that. Kaylin, what would you like to say? about what you look for um, when you are look, working with team members? Yeah, so in addition to the, the experience, like I said, I think that's one of the most important things. I, you know, listening to everybody, one thing that kind of popped into my head was, you know, your attitude. Um, so when I 
first got out of law school and I got my first job, it was in an area of law that I had never thought about before. Um, and I think one of the things um, I had a lot, I, I, a lot of people at that job was respected me. And I think part of it is the way I went into it. So I went into that job and I remember sitting with a paralegal and I was the attorney. And I remember saying at this moment in time, you know more than I do. Like, I need you to teach me. Like, I, I was really willing to learn. I knew that, that, I mean, you can go to college and you can learn all of the things and you can go to law school and learn all the things. But until you get into that job and you're doing it, at least in my experience, you, you have no idea. Like, there's a very big difference between doing a job and learning about it, um, which is why I think the experiential education is so important. And in this particular job, it was at a big law firm in Providence. You know, I went in and I sat with the paralegals and I sat with the other attorneys and I said, teach me everything you know, including the paralegals, because I know that at this moment in time, I may have the degree and the title of attorney, but in this world, I, this is new to me. This is my first time doing this. Um, so if you can help me, I, I really want that. And I, I got a lot of the paralegals and the staff and the other attorneys really respected me for that, because I think a lot of young people come out of school and they have this, I know what I'm doing attitude, when in reality, you kind of, as an employer or someone higher up want to say, well, sit down because you really don't. And you, you may have done really well in school and then at the top of your class and done all of the things, but it doesn't mean you know what you're doing here. So that, that willingness, especially when you start that eagerness to still learn and understand that you do have a long way to go still is just, it's huge to me. Um, if I have a potential intern walk into our office or interview with us on Zoom, we had one over the, over the winter or over the spring me and another attorney were interviewing her and she kind of had this know-it-all attitude like oh yeah no I know and it, it, we, we didn't end up hiring her as an intern because we said you know what no because you have you have no idea what we do and the person who we ended up hiring came in and said listen I've never done this before but I'm really interested in it and I'm willing to do whatever I have to learn and I think that's a huge attitude to have when you're coming out of school when you're first starting because it, it just it's so much different to do a job versus learn about it it really is that is so important. I'm so glad you're sharing this. And, you know, that's something I know a lot of faculty will share with their students. But like you're saying, Kaylin, until you're in that situation, you don't really understand it. So I'm really glad that you guys have all been through this situation and are sharing this today with our students. So Tiffany, if you want to finish out this question for the group, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so uh, similar to what Kaylin said, um, going into my field, um, I was really nervous. Um, so in the interview, I definitely gave a lot of confidence and like, I got this, I have some experience under my belt. Um, but once I actually got the job and was like my first day, I was freaking out. Like, what if this happens? What if that happens? Because I'm dealing with families in, in crisis. And I'm just like, what if I say this wrong? I don't know what this kind of like, like, even what Kaylin said, learning the language um, and talking to these different like providers and things like that. I'm like, I don't want to sound ridiculous. I don't want to not know what I'm talking about. They're using these acronyms. I don't even know what these acronyms mean. Um, so I was really thankful that my employer, my first employer and even the employer I have now have always been super open to questions, um, have always had like this open door policy with my supervisors where you can come by anytime, ask them anything, call them, text them. Um, super open. So even if I'm in like that crisis moment, I can call them and be like, hey, this is going on. Uh, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this the best thing I should do? Um, so I think definitely. And that also, I am like the youngest um, currently on my current position. It's like people who are all like at least 20 years older than me. Um, and so they have a lot of experience under their belt. And I am the new person coming in learning everything. Um, and so I ask them a ton of questions, too. Um, but I think that they like that. And they, like Kaylin said, they like that I'm not just pretending I know it and kind of like messing things up that I'm actually like asking and um, like willing to learn. So I think that that's something good for undergrads to hear because I think you can be really nervous thinking about going into the workforce and feeling like you have to kind of already be able to speed with these people who have like 20 plus years of experience and that they were really welcome. So yeah, that's kind of what I would say about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can I can attest that acronyms still get me to this day. I feel like they, they keep making new ones all the time. Um, so as we wind down, would each of you leave us with one final piece of advice 
that you believe the students need to hear before beginning their careers? I mean, you all have shared such amazing stories and such amazing advice so far, but I know there must be one more piece of advice you'd like to share. So I'm gonna start with Greg. Yeah, I would definitely say, um, so think of Johnson & Wales as an incubator. And while you're in it, um, you're allowed to make mistakes and to grow and learn who you wanna be. Um, you're, whoever that person is that you want to be, whatever you dream about doing, whatever you really are like, oh, I can't wait till I'm, you know, whether it's rich or successful in this type of field, or you want to make something, um, understand that the environment that you're in is specifically designed to foster that and to help you become that. So you have all of these resources at your disposal and you um, have all these professors who have like a vast array of knowledge that um, you can you know pick their brains about anything um, if you want to make something then you have all of these tools at your disposal that you can do that um, don't be afraid to you know get outside of the school to you know maybe find out what you want to do um, because that's what i did um, i don't have a background in real estate at all but i'm one of the lead reporters at my startup um, that works with the real estate industry um, and they were looking for someone that had already had experience as like um, a property manager or a broker or a financer, but I didn't have any of those. It's just, I was that interested in what I wanted to do. And everything I learned about um, what I currently use today, I learned at Johnson & Wales outside of the classroom, uh, but with the help of my friends at school and my professor. Um, so think about what it is that you wanna do and understand the environment you're in is going to help you get there. And it's much harder to um, really like change direction and change course once you're outside of school and you're, you know, in, you know, the working world and you don't necessarily have time to, you know, explore these options. Um, you know, just use every resource at the college to your advantage. Um, and if you're truly interested in what you want to do, um, that's how you get that job. Don't think about the job itself and now oh, I got to, you know, um, have this much experience and, you know, whatever the case is in terms of like years, um, just bring something to the table. You know, if you really are interested in a field, just, you know, prove that you know about it. Greg, thank you. Um, before I move to Sarah with the same question, I do want to ask the students out there, if you guys can please put your questions into the Q&A. As soon as we're done with this last bit of advice, we are going to turn to all of you to ask the questions that you have. All right, Sarah, what advice do you want to share? So Johnson Wales is a great um, foundation for everyone's career, but I think that a question that I was personally asked once I was graduating with my undergrad that definitely stuck with me is what is your worth? So um, when I was getting ready to graduate and I was doing all these job interviews, my uncle kind of sat me down and he said, you know what your worth is, right? And I was like, what? I don't know what my worth and my value is, but it definitely takes, you have to take time to think about what your worth is because when you go to interview for jobs, people might not see you at the same value as you see yourself at. So there were a lot of job offers that I just turned down because they weren't paying enough or we didn't have the same values. So you have to be prepared to have some disappointment. Not every job is going to be a perfect fit, but if you stick through it, do some job interviews, you'll find something that's worth it for you in the long haul. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Lindsay, what advice would you like to share? Um, I would definitely kind of go along with like what Greg had said about make your mistakes um, and pretty much just absorb everything that Johnson & Wales can give you. Um, they'll give you a lot of tools to use after college and you should really take that into consideration and what they tell you and learn as much as you can while you're in school. You know, it's, it's at your fingertips, so take it. Thank you. Kaylin. So I think mine is actually quite different than everybody else's and it, it, it could be just because of the experience I had. So I did the early enrollment program. I was 17 when I started and then I did it in three years. So I was actually 19 when I crossed the stage at the Dunkin Donuts Center. Um, so mine is a little bit more along the lines of, you know, enjoy this time. Um, 
it, college goes by so quickly. It seems like you're in it forever as you're going through it. But I say all the time what I would give to go back and spend some more time there and really get those out of classroom experiences, whether it's spending time with friends or really getting to know your professors and, you know, having them become mentors rather than just people that teach you for a semester, you know, whatever it is, um, you really take that time and enjoy where you are at this point in your life. College is both exhilarating and it's also terrifying. So I remember going to Johnson & Wales. I went in with one idea and then I came out knowing absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. And it was, it was really scary. But looking back, it was actually really exciting because you have all of these doors open to you. You're kind of at this crossroads where you can decide where you want to go and what path you want to go down. And that's really the first step of the rest of your life. Um, and you can always change later, but it don't, don't necessarily be worried if you don't know exactly what you're going to do after school or if you're not 100% sure of where you want to go next. Um, and really enjoy the experiences you can get now because it's four years seems like a long time and I was there three but it just goes by so fast and I would I would give anything you know now almost 10 years out which wow I'm still really old but I started Johnson & Wales 10 years ago this year and I, I would go give anything to go back and spend some more time there and really enjoy everything they have to offer because you're not going to get these years back. This is your one and only opportunity to really enjoy college and get both the academic and the social and the networking and the experiential opportunities that are available to you. That's wonderful, Kaylin. I feel that every day when I go into my classrooms and I look at my students, I'm like, you guys don't know what you have right now. Um, but I think maybe we have to remind our, the parents too that it's okay if their student doesn't know what they want to do when they graduate. They yeah. will be there. And you all are examples of that. Thank you. Tiffany, what advice would you like to share? Definitely very similar to Caitlin. I think that we live in a very fast paced world and we're kind of like the microwave generation. Like we want everything right now, right away. We don't like to wait. Um, so like learning to really be in the moment is so important for us, like to just be present um, in what we're doing, like especially as an undergrad, like I mentioned earlier, earlier just really when you're in class really soaking in what you're being taught and not just trying to race through the work and get it done so you can move on to something else I think our minds are always trying to jump to the next thing instead of really soaking in what we're receiving at the moment um, and so just really staying focused um, to really receive the most out of your studies and then like they also said like that maintaining those connections with our professors just taking that extra few minutes after class or before class to catch up with a professor um, because that really comes over to networking too um, and even like the groups that are offered on campus and things like that, like just any way that you can kind of make that networking happen, just really embracing everything that you have in that moment. Thank you, that's wonderful. We're gonna um, conclude this question with Niall. All right, well, um, my biggest advice that I can give you all is to take a deep breath and enjoy your ride um, because I was stressed. <laughs> I was very stressed when it was leading up to that moment of crossing the stage because I was like, I haven't found a job yet. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I wasn't, you know, embracing the moment of completing something so huge in my life. So definitely just say to yourself, I did this. There is a degree coming to me very soon in the mail and it is mine. It's going to have my name on it. It is mine. I did it no matter what you did to get there, you made it there. And that's, at the end of the day, that is your biggest conquer. Um, I definitely say after you finish graduation and you get to that point where you're like, okay, now what? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid to take chances. Don't be afraid to do something outside of your comfort zone. Yes, you chose this major, but there are a lot of fields that can still, you can still apply what you've learned at Johnson & Wells with. So don't be afraid to take that chance. Um, definitely continue to network, um, use LinkedIn. You know, a lot of people today are even using Twitter. Use Twitter if you can, make those professional accounts and keep working, keep finding people to, to work with. Um, and definitely just ask questions. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't hold it in and say, okay, well, I know everything and I'll just go with that. There are still things that you don't know and there are still things that you're going to learn throughout life. It, the learning process doesn't end when you get your, your bachelor's, your master's, your doctorate, it never stops. You're gonna continuously learn and just be open to that. 
So um, I just want to say congratulations to everyone, wherever you are in your um, process at Johnson and Wells, you've made it there. So congrats. I love that advice. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to turn now to student questions and, and students, please continue to post your questions in the Q&A. So the first question I have, and I'm just going to ask you guys, whoever wants to answer it first, um, on unmute your mic and I'll call your name. How did you figure out what you want to do for a career? Did you go into John Wales knowing what you want to do or were there resources within the university that it helped with that? Who wants to answer that first question? Did you go into John Wales already knowing what you want to do or did John Wales help you? Caitlin. So I went into Johnson & Wales thinking I wanted to be a cop. And then halfway through, I thought I wanted to switch careers and change to psychology and work with kids in the DCIYF world, totally different. And then I came out of it applying to law school. So it was a really weird, wild ride. Um, but I think what did it for me is the summer before my final year, so it would have been my junior summer, however, when you're there three years, whatever you call it, I interned um, very briefly with the Rhode Island Attorney General's office, and I wanted to kind of see the back end of, you know, what happens after somebody's arrested and all of that. And I came out of it, they had let me go into the courtroom um, just to kind of observe one day. I was really more working with victims, working on talking to victims of crimes, because obviously that's what you're going to have to do as a cop or a police officer, as Professor Desmaris would say, uh, Professor Sylvester would say, he hates when you say cop. Um, but they kind of let me go into the courtroom to observe one day and I ended up loving it. And then I came back to Johnson & Wales that final year and I remember talking to Professor Desmaris and he probably doesn't even remember this conversation, but I remember talking to him about how much I liked the courtroom and he had obviously read some of my papers and my questions and I had talked to him on a regular basis. And he kind of told me his story about how he was a police officer for many years and then he went to law school and he, he kind of said, you know what, kid, go for it. You know, I think you'd be good in the field. Um, I read your writing. You could hack it um, on that side of it. And if you really liked the courtroom, you know, maybe that's, that's a calling for you. And on a whim, I took the last LSAT available before applications are due. So applications are usually due like November, December. Um, I took the LSAT in October, got my results two weeks before I applied to law school. And then that's kind of what started this wild, weird journey. Um, and when I told my parents, they were shocked. They, they said, what? They, I had never talked about it before. I had never brought it up. Like I said, I come from a blue collar family. My dad's a small business owner and my mom worked in the school department. Neither one of them had ever gone to college. So the idea of going to a grad school was just completely out of nowhere. Um, so I'd say just ride the waves because you have no idea what you're going to fall into. Yeah, I'll be sure to share that with Professor Desmaris. If he, I'm not sure if he's on right now. Um, one more person because we have we have some more questions. Does anyone else want to share um, if they knew what they were going to do coming into John Wales or were there resources at the university that kind of changed your mind or helped you? Anyone else want to tackle this question? If not, I'll move to question two. I'll go. Okay, perfect. No, thank you. Um, I came into Johnson & Wales like a sponge, basically. I was going to like absorb what I can and figure it out on the way. I knew right away that I wanted to do something in media. Um, it's funny because when I applied for Johnson & Wales, I was actually um, an SEE major before I saw that they had added media communications. And I called right away and I was like, nope, I'm changing. I want this major. This is where I want to be. Um, it wasn't until I took um, writing for publications with Professor Garcia that I knew that that is what I wanted to do. Um, it was in that class where we all wrote um, like a chapter or two of a book um, of our own and we passed it around in like a round table and we all read each other's work and I said wow like I want to do this. I want to read other authors works. I want to give feedback. This is amazing. So I talked to Professor Garcia and then I was like, okay, I'm going to continue like this path of writing, continue this path of, this path of editing. Um, and to this day now I'm in my field and I actually do that. So it's like pretty cool that I'm doing something that I did in the classroom at my job. I'm actually passing work around, editing it, passing it to the author, working with the author, working with other fields in our company. And it's like, this is great. <laughs> like, I can't believe that this happened. And I actually thank her to this day for that. That is wonderful. I'm gonna move on to the next question if you guys don't mind. 
Um, so for the students who are graduating soon and who are beginning to search for jobs, what is the best way or advice to stay motivated during the job search process based on your experience? Sarah, I know you kind of touched upon this a little bit. I don't know if you want to continue or if someone else wants to go first, but you know, how do you stay motivated during the job search? I can expand a little bit on that. Um, when I was um, getting out of Johnson Wales in my undergrad, I did a lot of job interviews. Some I was overqualified for, some I was underqualified for, some I just fit the criteria. It's interesting because when you go for different jobs and you're not exactly sure what they're looking for, I've walked into some places and they said, you're overqualified, go look somewhere else because you'll be a better fit for somewhere else. And you can't be upset. You can't be like, oh, I didn't get that job because they're telling you that you're better than what they can provide for you. You want to make sure that you get a job that you can expand your role in and not limited. So you want to make sure even if you're going to jobs and you're not getting um, accepted for jobs, that it's probably for the best and that you should just keep continuing um, your job search and don't get discouraged in it. I love that answer. Um, Greg, I see you keep shaking your head. I love how Sarah, you said before, know your worth, but then also if you don't get the job, it's for a good reason. Something better is out there for you. So thank you, Greg. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's definitely the um, thought process that you need to have. Um, you know, everyone I, I guarantee will have like a certain job or a certain field or a certain company that they they think that they're meant for and that they know that they want. And um, uh, when I was in college, I wanted to work in television broadcasting. That was my thing. And I always wanted to work for like Turner. So whether it was for like, you know, CNN or Cartoon Network or whatever, that's what I wanted to do. And I spent years like applying for over and over again, everything like internships to um, uh, actual like, you know, um, fellowships or the job itself. And um, it's okay if you don't get it um, because uh, you shouldn't be spending, you know, four years or more working for just one specific position, one specific job, um, you know, just to motivate yourself to keep applying day in and day out, keep an open mind that um, it's firstly okay if you get um, rejected or you don't hear back or they don't choose you, um, but also that, you know, it, it's cliche to say, but like it really does open a door for another one to come along. Um, you don't want to take something and then realize that you don't like it. And then, um, you know, you may be passed up an opportunity that probably would have been better for you. Um, but even that happens too. And it's okay. You just, you know, stay motivated and, you know, you keep pushing yourself to apply every day, whether it's a certain amount, you know, you dedicate your time to apply to like you know, 10 a day or whatever it is. Um, you know, just know that it's, it's going to work. Um, it's a little bit of a numbers game, but it's also, you're worth it. You're, um, you know, you, you are at a position where, um, you're able to seize what you're applying for. It's just a matter of time. That's such a great answer. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to call out Tiffany on this one, just because Tiffany, you had mentioned this before. Um, so maybe you want to elaborate, but the question is, what about mentorship? Um, did you have any mentors who helped you? How did you develop that relationship? And I know Tiffany, you had said this at the beginning, so maybe you want to expand upon that. Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier that I had um, met Dr. Fidi at Community College of Rhode Island. Um, and so I literally, I think I only had psychology class with her, but I had taken a lot of classes with her because I really liked her teaching style. Um, and so just through that, just through kind of um, having those before and after class conversations and checking in um, and her seeing the quality of the work that I was doing, we really kind of just started to talk more and more. Um, and then she really just kind of started to offer herself to me and offer me opportunities and try to connect me with different resources. Um, and then I worked in the um, Student Success Center. Um, and so she had actually um, convinced me to be a tutor for her psychology classes. And I had not done any tutoring prior to that. Um, so then that kind of opened me up to that experience. Um, and then because we started to work so closely because I was tutoring her students, um, when, when she did leave community college and she started to work at Johnson Wales, we maintained that contact. 
Um, and she's always been super motivational to me. Like she thinks I'm gonna go so far and I'm gonna do all these great things. And she's always been super supportive in that way. Um, so when she went to Johnson and Wales and I started to look into the program, even at Johnson and Wales, like I would, even if I wasn't taking her class, I'd just go up to her office, talk to her, check in every now and then. Um, she helped me get like a part-time job while I was in school as well. Um, and just advice. So like, even now that I'm in my process of applying to grad school, kind of just checking back with her, like what kind of things should I be looking for in the program? And um, she's writing my reference letters for me. Or like, even when I applied for jobs, like she wrote my refer letters of recommendation um, and things like, like that. So it's definitely a, a great support to have. Um, she spoke so highly of me to like my supervisors and they were super impressed with like the recommendations that they got from her. Um, so it's definitely a must to like find a mentor while you're in school um, among the professors. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm actually just gonna to turn to Lindsay. I know we have to get going, but Lindsay, I didn't know if you wanted to be able to answer any of those last three questions um, about if you had a mentor here at Johnson Wales, um, you know, maybe about staying motivated about searching for a job or just any last thoughts that you want to um, say to those who have attended today. Um, definitely like when searching for a job, like I had to really kind of keep myself motivated by just keeping an open mind. Um, and, you know, I accepted a job right out of college. Um, I had it already lined up right when I graduated. Um, so I had gone out and, you know, tried it and stuff and it didn't really work out for me, but I still kept an open mind and I had that experience and then I wanted more experience. Um, and as far as the other um, question, about which, what was that one again? The second one? Just um, any mentors at Johnson Wales? Um, I would say like I've had quite a few handful of people definitely that I can go back to um, through Johnson and Wales. Um, two professors actually, um, I'm, I think one's maybe not working there anymore, but I had two that were both riding instructors for me in, during college. Um, and I've been able to connect with still um, on my own professional level and pretty much anyone that I can ask any questions that has been in this field for a long time, I've been able to go back um, and just try to keep those connections with the mentors that I have. That's um, wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I hate to stop what we're doing right now because I've had so much fun and I know everyone attending has as well. I just want to thank you to our alumni for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. You are a wealth of knowledge and the experiences you shared with us were inspiring and so appreciated. Please remain connected with us. We are so proud of you. And I know I'm gonna go tell every single faculty member that you all mentioned today, and I know they're gonna be proud of you. Students, we hope that you found this information insightful and helpful for navigating your own career path. This concludes today's session. Although a virtual presentation does not lend itself to post event mingling, please feel free to connect with the alumni virtually to continue the conversation and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You want us to drop our contact?